Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studio, it's time for Family Business Radio. Showcasing outstanding family businesses and the advisors who assist them. Good afternoon, listeners, and welcome to another lovely episode of Family Business Radio. I am your host, Anthony Chen. Today, we have two lovely guests with us, Neil and Sally David from the David Academy. Neil and Sally, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Likewise, likewise. So kind of jumping right into it, share with us how the idea of your academy came about. Well, that's a great question, Anthony. Uh, it goes back to 2000 and gosh, 2000, 2009 probably. Uh, I am by trade a Latin teacher and I became involved with a tight-knit organization called the Junior Classical League. And as a result of that, I began to attend these national competitions that brought the brightest teenage brains from all across the country into these huge competitions at a national level. And uh, as I brought the Georgia teams there, we were getting slaughtered in these competitions. And I um, am the youngest of three boys and uh, the sixth of seven children. And if you know anything about birth order, when you're the youngest male in a family with a father who's a master sergeant, you probably learn that we're extremely competitive people. And so I do not like losing at anything. Mm-hmm. And so these people have been doing this great competition that was highly competitive for years. And I was on the outside looking in and my kids were getting slaughtered. And I just refused to believe that kids in Georgia were dumber than kids anywhere else. Uh, or maybe I just refused to believe that I was dumber than anyone else. I don't know. <laughs> but regardless, it fueled me to ask many questions, find out what was going on. So uh, after a few years, I was invited along with my students to Harvard to compete in something called a Kertamen competition, which is like a Latin quiz bowl. Uh, 75 schools from all across the country, most of them the elite private academies from all across the country that have been around for hundreds of years. And I'm this public school teacher from Georgia. We're the only Southern school there and probably the only public school there. And we go in there and we absolutely kick their tails. We come in third, second, and first. And on the way home, on the flight home, this mother, the mother who was the chaperone, said to me, I was going with, you know, the economy was kind of going through something similar to what it's going through right now. Not quite as bad as the, you know, the recession was still having a problem and a, a huge impact upon my own life personally with furloughs and all that. And I just had my second child and we needed money. And I've been working two jobs, mostly as a tutor, ever since before we got married. And the mother said, how are you going to pay for your children's education? And I just had this spiritual awakening. (laughs) If I continue to do what I'm doing right now and complain about it, like everyone else I'm surrounded by, because, you know, in the teaching profession, we're great people, but we're kind of used to getting kicked around a little bit and complain about it, but don't really do a lot about it necessarily all the time. And I just hit me. I was like, I got to do something differently. And so I just decided on the airplane on the way home, I've got to become a business and start acting like a businessman and start uh, charging people for this platinum level of service that I was providing to their children. I've been providing this service for years for relatively nothing, for free. And uh, that's kind of where it came from. On the flight back home from Harvard, uh, Boston, 2011. Wow. So how's that journey taking? Was it kind of a seamless transition for you? Well, you know, I mean, I took what I was already doing, uh, which was tutoring, and just turned it into a more professional model. I became an LLC. Uh, I began to um, charge a little bit more appropriately to the level of service I was providing. Uh, but still, it was kind of a just a, really a, a way for me to prevent the tax man from sending me to jail. I was afraid that I was getting so much uh, so much traffic from parents who wanted me to help their kids with Latin that I just didn't want to end up uh, becoming unethical. I don't want the tax man to, to take me away for you know not paying the taxes. So I use it mainly as a way by which I could have people pay into a business. And then about two years later, I met a man who did business 
consulting and he took me on and began to you know show me some i'm not a businessman in my nature i've become one over the last 10 years but i was not initially and so he taught me how to transition from being a a teacher to becoming a businessman so I, i began to figure out who my clientele wasn't who my clientele was how to price that appropriately, how to market that correctly, how to work that while also working my full-time job and uh, you know, offer products like SAT and ACT prep because doing Latin by itself is a, is a great market, but it's a small niche market. And if I wanted to take the company uh, beyond just you know the 10 or 15 or 20 kids I was working with every year, I had to, to branch out. So that's it's a, it was a process over a few years for me to kind of figure out what kind of business I wanted to have and how I wanted to present myself. You know, seeing him go through that transition of, you know, I'm a teacher and I'm used to the educational world. How do you, you know, translate that into a professional world in a meaningful way? And when we were newly married, he had taught an SAT prep class at, you know, somebody else's academy. And he would see these kids that he would work with, bright kids, but they hated every minute of being stuck in this classroom for four hours on a Saturday that mom and dad were making them do. And he felt like there has to be a better way to approach that because SAT and ACT prep, and this is something I'm sure we'll get to, but it's um, it's really one of the, the benchmark things that teens have to go through if they have college aspirations. And so how can we make that experience for these kids more meaningful rather than, Oh my gosh, I have to give up every Saturday for the next eight weeks. I hate this. I don't want to do it. Um, this is so boring. Uh, I mean, these were the things that he would come home and share with me that, you know, the kids were going through. And so there, there was a lot of development, I think, based on his experience in the classroom, um, you know, with the prep, but also just years of experience of teaching high schoolers, which, you know, Life doesn't prepare you for that. So anyway, it, I think he learned a lot of what works and what doesn't work, which has given him a little bit more of a unique outlook on, all right, how do we take this, you know, this test that millions of, you know, high schoolers are taking, how do we prepare them for that in a more unique way that's going to keep them engaged and hopefully give them some better success? So it, I wouldn't say it's been a... Um, it wasn't like a flipping of the switch there, you know, like any business, there's a lot of trial and error and figuring out how that works. So kind of segueing into the next question, as you mentioned about students uh, coming into the classroom, already having some level of expectation to all oh, be here. Uh, what is it that makes your academy unique where it actually engages them, where it actually look forward to it? Right. It's all about the individualized test prep model. The people we hire, including me, have tremendous amounts of experience in the classroom and they know how to talk to teenagers and understand the ways, the many, many ways and winding roads of how the team brain works. And so it's not just some cookie cutter model that was developed by some person 60, 70 years ago, taught by someone who has no personal relationship with the child. We do all of our uh, sessions one-on-one with the kids. We don't work in the classroom model. And the reason we don't work in the classroom model is, well, the classroom model can work for some things. When it comes to a test like this, it needs to be individualized because every kid has different hangups and different ways of coming to this test. So we individualize it to the point where the kids have 24 seven access to it. They can, they can text me, call me, the parents can text me, call me, or not me, but anyone that's working with them, whoever the particular master teacher is that's working with them, they have 24-7 access. So really, what we do, the way we call it, we're like, we're like, we work on like a lawyer model. You put us on a retainer, and then during the time that you have the retainer with us, you have complete and unfettered access to us and all of our experience, wisdom, uh, knowledge, and uh, unique methodology toward the SAT, the ACT, or any of the other services we provide like teen-focused life coaching uh, and other content-based expert-level tutoring. So kind of going into this, I mean, when should families even begin contemplating the test prep process for their kids? 
That's a great question. Uh, and uh, one we hear all the time, all the time. So first thing you need to know is the SAT and the ACT scores are good for five years. So actually, an eighth grader, not that I suggest this, but an eighth grader could actually take the SAT and the ACT and be done with it in eighth grade and use those scores to apply to college as a senior. Now, what we suggest and what we found to be a very effective model is to actually begin the first semester or second semester of the 10th grade year. And for a really unique student, it's great to do it in the ninth grade year, the end of the ninth grade year. The reason why is because most people default because, and I get it, it's a lot of busyness going on. Even the SAT and the ACT say, you know, first semester of your junior year, do this. It's because they've got to develop a pattern that works for the millions of people that take it. But in fact, when you're in an urban area like Atlanta or other urban areas around the United States, and maybe even other less urban areas, non-metro areas, you, most kids have encountered the higher level math they need to encounter in order to be successful in the SAT and ACT by about the second semester of the ninth grade year. And so all of the content, and this is going to sound weird, all of the content necessary to master the SAT and the ACT are usually taught to most of these kids by the end of a ninth grade year. So then you might say, well, then what do they need you for if they already know all the content? The challenge with the SAT and the ACT is not the content. The challenge is the many tricky, crazy ways that the SAT and the ACT ask you things that you actually already know. And so if we can get kids in the ninth and 10th grade years, normally 10th grade years, to go through this process, and we do it small chunks over a long period of time, then they're much more prepared to handle this test. But what unfortunately most people do is they wait until the 11th grade year, and the vast majority of kids have their most difficult academic year in the 11th grade. They're taking the most AP or IB courses. They're starting to drive. They're getting to develop their own unique social lives with boyfriends and girlfriends. And they're getting involved in the leadership levels of the clubs and all these sorts of things. And so then parents say or counselors say or mentor adults say, oh, now it's time to take the SAT or ACT. And you add that to all those things I just mentioned, and it becomes such a pressure-filled situation for the kids that candidly it turns into this big fight in the home and the kids are, you know, turned against mom and dad and mom and dad are against the kids and it's just a mess. And so because the vast majority of kids we deal with already have the content necessary uh, to master the SAT and the ACT, by the end of the ninth grade year, we suggest that time. It's much smoother. The kids we deal with that are starting in the 11th grade year as compared to the kids we're dealing with that start in the 10th grade year have a, the kids in the 10th grade year have a much uh, easier, gentle, uh, likable time rather than the pressure-filled stress craziness of waiting until the 11th grade year or even worse, the summer between the 11th and 12th grade year or the first semester of the 12th grade year, which is like doomsday. So does that, uh, I think that answers the question. Yeah, it sounds like you've done this for a little while. What's the thought process behind it, too? So, so was this kind of a trend you also caught pretty early on uh, as you were developing your academy and curriculum? Yes, trial and error for sure. Uh, actually, my business advisor uh, told me that I was going to do uh, SAT and ACT prep. <laughs> I didn't know <laughs> okay. that I was going to do it. He said, no, you're going to do SAT and ACT prep. And actually, the first person you're going to work with is going to be my son. Uh, he took a great chance on me and uh, a lot of trial and error many, many years ago with that. And he was already in the 11th grade. And just seeing what other companies were doing, I mean, I'm, I'm all about learning from other people. And so I would go onto other people, other companies' websites. I'd read their materials. I'd talk to parents. I'd talk to counselors. I'd get in conversations with my wife and just kind of, you know, that. Other students, yeah, I mean, because I still was a teacher at the time, like I talked to my students, I had just a wealth of experiences and opportunities that I think a lot of other test prep companies just didn't have because I had such a background with so many kids on not only 
a classroom level, but I was taking thousands of kids to all of these competitions for years. And so I got to talk to kids from all walks of life and all across the United States and find out what worked and what didn't work. And so what, what worked and what didn't work, excuse me. And so we developed this model based upon a tremendous amount of investigation, reading, experience, conversations, um, and honestly, a lot of humility. I mean, I, you know, understanding that I didn't know everything. Um, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, uh, uh, or at least I don't need to be. Uh, and uh, I wanted to be effective. And so when you're wanting to be effective and do things that mean something to the kids and the parents, uh, your ego gets checked at the door. You don't care what people think about you. All you care about is getting the result. And this is what gets the best results. Yeah, what's notable is how you actually mentioned taking into their perspective, their social life, you know, whether they're a relationship or taking into leadership uh, positions in junior year. And now that I'm thinking back to my days, like, yeah, I didn't think about that. But I can imagine, as an example, you point out 10th graders having a much, I guess, less stress-inducing, anxiety fuel panic <laughs> life yes. and waiting until like the 11th grade. Uh, we've, we've heard from a lot of parents. Thank you for that advice because now it's out of the way and they can enjoy the last two years and whatever that means for that particular child, you know, that means being able to take on these roles or just enjoying the extracurricular activities, their sports, their whatever. Um, now that test prep is out of the way, you know, freeze up their schedule for those things. It's terrible. It really is. I deal with some of these students who are under the clock to get this score, to get the Zell Miller scholarship, or this coach is telling them you got to get this exact score here or higher, or you can't get the scholarship. And to see them in their 12th grade year sweating over this while trying to keep their GPA up and keep a job or keep the, it's just, it's overwhelming. Some of these kids break. I mean, they, they're great test takers. I mean, they're great. Yeah, they're great test takers in the in the time that we're together. But then they go in and take the test, and they just feel this pressure, this weight of expectation, and it really turns them into. I, mean, I see kids that are doing great during the practice, and then they go into these situations where they're just they're, they're twelfth graders or they're late, you know, semester eleventh graders, and the pressure can really cook them big time to the point where they drop. 20, 30 percent of what they were scoring on practice tests over the course of months of data. So you're absolutely right. So kind of looking into all these uh, avenues of testing for the SAT and ACTs, uh, for parents who are just kind of new in this world, should they take both or is there pros and cons taking both or should they have a preference for one? Great question. Another one that we hear all the time. So again, the standard default wisdom that people hear from these companies, because these companies are companies, they're not, everyone has this idea that if you are somehow involved in education, you are this altruistic person who never wants to make a profit. That is the absolute <laughs> not truth uh, of what's going on with these test prep companies. They are, they say they're nonprofit and they're nonprofit, but that does not mean they're not for profit. They're all about the profit. And if they can get you to take the SAT three times, the ACT twice, that is not only four hours of a Saturday over five Saturdays that you've taken up, it's 50 or $80, five times you spent when there's so many free resources out there to help you to decide which test is right for you. And both of these tests are accepted at every single college that accepts them with the exact same weight, there's absolutely no advantage to taking both of them. You can figure out which one you are most suited to just by taking a real SAT or a real ACT from the comfort of your home and then just say, okay, I like this one, I hate this one, or I, oh, well, no one really likes the SAT and the ACT. I hated this one a little bit less than I hated that one, and or I'm more suited to this one more so than that one. And of course, that's something we encounter all the time. We can get to the minutiae of why a kid might be more suited to the SAT as compared to the ACT. But there's no need to stress about that. It's an easily answered question. All kinds of content, by the way, on our website about that. Um, we're more than happy to share with people. But it is a process that can take about an hour and a half on a Saturday 
in your ninth grade year, a kid could figure out. And then once they decide that the SAT or the ACT is right for them, they just can forget about it. Forget that the other tests even exist. Never mention that ever again, because it will not have any kind of impact upon their life whatsoever. So, so I'm, I'm understanding that someone can just, on their ninth year, kind of do a trial or a test run on both and right, kind of yeah, absolutely. gauge what they're strong with or not strong with. Absolutely. No, they totally can. So the SAT and the ACT both on their websites have all kinds of free resources of old, you know, recycled, real SATs or real ACTs. And you can go there and you can just print them out and take a look at them. And, you know, do like the reading section of the SAT, the sit down and time it and do the reading section of the ACT and, and do the same with the math and just compare them and see how you feel as you time it. And uh, you'll know every kid knows. I've never had any kid ever uh, vacillate as to, oh, I don't know if the SAT or the ACT is right for me. They always know. Uh, they always know. They, they, they love one and hate the other or they love one a lot. Well, they hate one a lot less than they hate the other. I mean, they, they always have a very strong reaction to it. And I, and, I, and I explain it. Usually within two minutes when I explain to the parents and the kids the differences between the two tests, the kids even know already. When I tell them the difference, they're like, oh, yeah, uh, that test is going to be the right one for me. And I'd say nine times out of ten, they go and take the mock test or whatever, and it gets confirmed, oh, yes, the SAT or the ACT was the right one for me. So you mentioned uh, about all these free available resources online. I guess the next best question is, I think you kind of touch a little bit on this. All right, so if I can get all this quote-unquote free stuff, why would I come to an academy like yours? That's a great question. You know, Michael Jordan could learn to play basketball by watching lots of people. But if he wanted to become the absolute best at it, he had to get coaching. And you are absolutely right. For the vast majority of people, they don't have the drive and the ambition to sit and do the things they need to do in order to become excellent at these tests. Handily speaking, we have got some methods that are developed in such a way that are they're keyed in on exactly all of the tricks and half-truths and sneaky little things the SAT and the ACT does. I don't know that a kid, even a really smart, highly functional, ambitious kid in high school, has the wherewithal to see through all the different challenges and problems that uh, are presented by the SAT. So it's the coaching element, it's the mentoring element, it's the methodology element. Uh, one of the things we have kids do on the SAT and the ACT, which you would never figure out on your own, is we have kids skip the reading passages. We we have a way by which they can they can and not trick themselves into all these wrong answers. Because, again, the whole reading passages themselves are filled with all this stuff that kids do not need in order to answer the questions correctly. So we teach them how to skip the reading passages and actually answer every single question on the reading section without actually reading the reading passages. That's not something you can figure out on your own from the comfort of your own home. Sounds like it's a whole new method of, of testing, really. Figuring out, cracking the code, really. Well, you know, it really was. It was something I developed actually from the world of Latin. Uh, I, there's a, something called the National Latin Exam that I gave my kids for years as a Latin teacher. And in 2011 or 12, I had like 120 kids from my high school take this test. And it's a nationally normed test given like 150,000 kids from all across the country. And about one out of every thousand kids would get a perfect score. But I taught the kids not only the content of the Latin, but I also taught them how to be effective test takers and how to use strategic uh, elimination strategies and things like that to manage the test. And so my students scored 45 times the national average in 2011, 12, 13, all these years. I mean, I, I should have one kid out of, out of my group of kids get a perfect score, I would have like 25 or 30 kids, 23, I think my high school was 23 kids get a perfect score out of 112 kids. And I had, you know, like 65 or 70 percent of my kids score in the top 10 percent. And it's because I don't know that my kids were necessarily all that better than the top level other great kids in the country, but I taught them how to 
take a test really effectively. And if some some teachers might take offense to that, but I have no problem with it. My job was to teach them Latin, but my job also was to give them the results they needed to get to that next step in life. And so again, I check my ego at the door. My deal with the SAT and the ACT is it's not about how smart I am. I, I don't care if people think I'm brilliant. All I care about is do I have a method that can help these kids get the results they need to get to the next step in life? And if that means other educators look down upon my method, that's fine. So, so it sounds like you're definitely having the results, especially with your students now. Uh, getting the results they want in terms of the testing field. So, Sally, you mentioned a little bit about the feedback from the parents. I mean, how, how is that like? Well, we love getting the feedback from the parents. One of the things that we do um, in between meetings with the kids is every parent gets an update on this is what we talked about during that time any questions that the parents have, we want to be accessible to them as well because they are kind of taking us on as a consultant, really an academic consultant for their kid during this process. And sometimes that is, um, you know, having to play a little, be a little bit of a psychologist for the parents too. You know, this is a big deal, what these kids are going through and what they're trying to achieve and family dynamics, you know, can, um, can play a large role in that. And so, my mom and dad kind of turning over this aspect of it to us uh, it allows them to just be a supportive mom and dad, but still be well aware of what's going on. And so a lot of the Google reviews and things that we've gotten are both from the children and from the parents that they're so happy to see their kids engaged. They got a positive result. It was a little bit less stressful for mom and dad, which let's face it, mom and dad are the ones who are paying the bill for this. We want to make sure that it's a great experience for the kid and they get out of it what they need, but that mom and dad also felt like they were taken care of and that they understood what was going on in the process. Um, so, you know, I think it's, we've, we've certainly gotten feedback from mom and dad saying, thank you for giving us a heads up before junior and senior year. Uh, we also have parents saying to us things like, "Uh oh, well, now my kid's a junior or my kid's a senior. They still don't have the score that they want. Is it too late? And we have the opportunity then as well to, you know, calm their fears a little bit and and do what we can. And I think sometimes just as a mom, as a dad, you care about your kid's success in this area, of course, and you want to provide whatever resources you can to help them to be successful. And it's sometimes good just to have somebody to to hear you out on that. You know, we need advice as parents. We, you know, what is going to be the best way to do it? Can, who can I ask all my questions to and get those questions answered by somebody who is knowledgeable in this specific area? Well, you're not just coaching for uh, the students, you're also coaching for the parents here as well. So how, how best can a parent reach out to you? Best way to contact you? Well, best way to contact us uh, is by giving us a call. We do work with students all over the country because it is a Skype format and not having to attend a local class somewhere. Um, we've had that opportunity. And we one of the best things I think probably about doing the, the Skype is it's all going to start with a consult with the family. So we'll do like a 30 minute, just a free consult mom and dad and student or whoever all wants to be a part of that. Um, the, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, so they can either give me a call, they can shoot us an email, they can find out any of that information on our website. And uh, we'd be happy to set up that consult, answer a lot of those questions and have us have an opportunity to get to know the family, kind of see what the dynamic is there. That way, um, when we're done with that, mom and dad and student can talk about it and figure out what is this going to be a good fit? You know, is this really going to help us to achieve that goal? Um, our local Atlanta number is 770-383, excuse me, 1320. Uh, so they can certainly give us a call there. And uh, your website or email? Yes, it's thedavidacademy.com. And you can either send an email to me, which is sally.burke at thedavidacademy.com or to neil at neil.david at thedavidacademy.com. Well, thank you so much for sharing. That's right. <laughs> We're always open too. Certainly, certainly. Well, great. Well, that, you heard it from Sally and Neil.
Now, this show is sponsored and brought to you by yours truly, Anthony Chen with Lighthouse Financial Network, securities and advisory services offered through Royal Alliance Associates, Inc., RIA member of FINRA SIPC, RIA is separately owned and other entities and or marketing names, products or services referenced here are independent of RIA. The main office address is at 575 Broad Hollow Road, Melville, New York, 11747. You can best reach me at 631-465-9090 at extension 5075 or my email at my full name, Anthony Chen, C-H-E-N, at LFN, L-L-C, dot com. Thank you for listening. Until next time, thank you for listening to Family Business Radio.